Hello, friends, and welcome to the last little bit of Structure 3.2. We're going to talk about functional groups and how we can take advantage of their properties to carry out some fractional distillation. Our understandings are here if you want to pause the video and read them. Otherwise, our objectives are reviewing homologous series, We're going to explain distillation, and then describe fractional distillation in oil refineries. Remember that homologous series are compounds that have the same functional groups. They differ only by one CH2. So we're just lengthening that carbon chain. Here we have the alkane homologous series, methane, ethane, propane, butane. We could keep going pentane, hexane, heptane. The only difference from one of these to the next is that we have added a CH2. We added a CH2. We have lengthened the carbon chain. They have similar chemical properties, and then their physical properties show a gradual change as that carbon chain lengthens. We are looking here at boiling points of these alkanes. Notice that methane has the lowest of the boiling points. That boiling point increases as we lengthen the carbon chain. Why? Increasing intermolecular forces. Here, since we have just carbons and hydrogens, we're talking just about London dispersion forces. All of these molecules have London dispersion forces, but the more carbons and hydrogens we have, the more electrons there are, the bigger the molecule, the stronger those London dispersion forces, and therefore the higher the boiling point. Here's another example of a homologous series. This one happens to be primary alcohols. Remember that alcohols have hydroxyl groups. Primary alcohols are going to have a hydroxyl group bound to a carbon that is bound to only one other carbon ethanol, propan 1-all, butan 1-all, all primary alcohols, hydroxyl group on a carbon bound to just one other carbon. I have graphed the boiling points of methanol, ethanol, and butan 1-all. I skipped propanol. Here are the number of carbons in each of these primary alcohols. And our y-axis is boiling point in degrees Celsius. We can predict the boiling point of propan 1 all by looking at the trend. So the boiling point of methanol is 66 degrees Celsius, ethanol is 79 degrees Celsius, butan 1 all is 138 degrees Celsius. So somewhere between these guys, let's pretend like that's a line of best fit, we're guessing somewhere around 100. And in fact, the boiling point of propan 1 all is. 97 degrees Celsius between 79 and 138 as predicted. If we have a mixture of substances, for example, compounds of a homologous series that have different boiling points, we can separate that mixture into its components using distillation. Sometimes IB might ask us to explain a process like distillation. Explain means to add some reasons. We need to have some cause and effect make sure that you're using the word because here and there in your explanations. Let's go ahead and explain distillation. We're going to put our mixture in this example. We've got some salt water into a distillation flask. We can also call a distillation flask a boiling flask or a round bottom flask. We're going to sometimes add to our mixture some boiling chips. Boiling chips are little pieces of calcium carbonate basically marble, and this is just going to prevent our mixture from splashing too much as it boils. How are we going to get our mixture to boil? We're going to add some heat because we are adding heat to the mixture. The mixture is going to perhaps start to evaporate because our mixture has components that have different boiling points. These components are going to boil, evaporate at different times as heat is being added. So we can add the heat. Our salt water is going to get warmer, warmer, warmer. And because the boiling point of water is much lower than the boiling point of salt, we're going to get some water vapor form. That water vapor is going to rise, rise, rise because it's a gas. And it's going to run into this rubber stopper. The rubber stopper has a thermometer in it. Because the thermometer is here, we can monitor the temperature at which these different components are boiling. Because that rubber stopper is there, the water vapor cannot 
just go up, up, and away, but instead it is forced to travel down the inside of the condenser. The condenser is a tube within a tube. So our water vapor is here on the inner tube of the condenser. We're going to attach to the outer tube of the condenser, literally a tube, that is going to carry some cold water from the sink. That cold water from the sink is going to travel around the outside of that inner tube, the outer tube of the condenser, and then end up in yet another piece of tubing that's gonna take that water straight back to the sink so it can go down the drain. Because the cooling water is surrounding the vapor on the inside of the condenser, the vapor is going to be cooled from a gas back to a liquid. Literally, it's going to condense and then drip into our collection or receiving flask. We're going to call that pure water the distillate, the product of distillation. Because the salt and the water have different boiling points, because water's boiling point is lower, it's going to evaporate first. Because we're adding that cool water on the outside of the condenser, the water vapor is going to condense back to liquid water and we can collect that pure water here. We have explained distillation. In lab, we often use distilled water. How I distill our water for lab is with this guy called a tabletop distiller. How it works is this. I fill up the bottom part with some water from the tap. Here in Texas, we have a lot of minerals in our water. We're going to add some heat because water has a lower boiling point than do all those minerals. What happens is the water will start to boil, it will evaporate, it will become water vapor. That water vapor is going to rise, it ends up up here. There's a fan spinning in the top of this tabletop distiller, and what's going to happen is that water is going to cool back down to a liquid, it's going to condense from vapor back to liquid, and it's gonna drip, drip, drip into the storage tanks that I set under the distiller, and voila, we have distilled water for lab. Distillation is also how oil refineries work. In fractional distillation, we're going to take a mixture of lots and lots of things. Crude oil is a mixture of wax and asphalt and fuel and diesel, kerosene, petrol, gasoline, and then methane, ethane, other kinds of gases. So what we're going to do is take our crude oil and we're going to send it into a furnace. That furnace is going to heat up the oil. The components of this mixture of crude oil that have the lowest boiling points, our natural gases are going to evaporate first. They are going to rise to the top as they evaporate and we can extract them from the mixture because they have a different boiling point from all of those other components. We can change these different temperatures in our fractional distiller and pull out the pieces that have different boiling points. Our octane, our petrol, is going to get pulled out at about 150 degrees Celsius. Kerosene has a slightly higher boiling point, diesel higher yet. We're going to end up with, at the very bottom, asphalt and wax and some lubricating oils. This is fractional distillation. We can literally fraction out the crude oil into its components because those components have different boiling points. And we have arrived already at the end of this video lecture. By using our predictions of properties, we can distill the components of homologous series distillation using different boiling points to separate components of a mixture, fractional distillation specifically, taking some crude oil and separating it into all of those components, those fossil fuels that we love to put into our cars and trucks. Well done today, friends.